All right. And okay, so we want to welcome you if you've been watching on Facebook Live. We're going to open in prayer. We're going to be in Revelation chapter four tonight, and we'll look at Ezekiel chapter one also. And if you would like to join us in the Zoom Bible study, as you can see the screen, uh, we have uh, they have notes and uh, access to documents as well as the audio recording for this. Obviously, you can have that video on Facebook on Facebook. But if you'd like to access that, then send me a note on Messenger, a Facebook Messenger, or an email if you have my email address, and let me know. I need your e I need your email address to send you the link. Uh, so tonight we're going to open them up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump into Revelation chapter four. All right. So Father, we come to you tonight. Uh, we pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord, who are struggling tonight. Um, Dave and Carol with COVID. We ask your mercy upon them and give them strength and relief. Uh, to overcome that, our brother John and Shirley, we just pray for your blessings upon their health, um, too, as they um, struggle to get well, and may you have mercy and bring healing to them. And we pray for our brother Anthony and his family tonight as they are away. We thank you for them and ask that your mercy be upon them when they're traveling, their vehicle, and whatever might be happening. And for others, Lord, we know that are, that are not with us tonight, that have been with us in the past, we pray for your mercy and blessings upon them, whether it's Jazz or Leah and others. Um, bless them in all things. And we thank you for this opportunity we have now. We ask indeed that your Holy Spirit would be the speaker through us and to us, and that you convict our hearts of the truth of the gospel, and that we would understand and discern and be transformed by the words that we hear. We thank you for this opportunity now. We pray your blessings upon us in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, let's begin. So uh, uh, with chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, if someone, or Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, if somebody wants to read that, please feel free to go ahead and do so. Any translation is fine. English, I guess, would be kind of required, though, for those of you guys in India, just go ahead and do it in English. I can read it. Thank you. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which i had heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said come up here and i will show you what must take place after these things immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was standing in heaven and someone was sitting on the throne and he who was sitting on who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne like the em like an emerald in appearance Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, four living creature, full, creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Thank you. All right. Any questions or thoughts or comments or observations as we get started? Welcome, Chris and Marcus. What do you see? What do you notice? I see 24 thrones and 24 elders. Okay. And then there's seven lamps. Okay. And, and the four creatures. Okay. Very good. And the numbers should be significant to us by now, right? We're starting to get used to the numbers. So where do you think the number 24 comes from? Two times 12? It's 12 times two, yeah. So we've said three and four are the key numbers. Three represents uh, the divine, God. Four represents the created realm, the, heaven, the four corners of the earth, the four winds, four directions. 
three plus four is seven, which is uh, perfection or completion with regards to often the creation, but it can be used for God or the divine. It's kind of completion or perfection. Three times four is 12. And that's the number for the God's people. So the 12 tribes of the Old Testament, 12 apostles of the New Testament. So we have those numbers to kind of work with. Uh, then we can add the number two, um, which we'll see later on, chapter 11. The two is the number for um, a trustworthy testimony based on um, Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy 19.6 or something like that. Um, on the basis of two or three witnesses, a testimony is trust, becomes tr trustworthy. Um, and so it, it's two or three in the book of Deuteronomy, but it becomes two. Jesus sends the disciples out in pairs in Mark 9 and then Mark 10, or Luke 9, Luke 10, um, and elsewhere. And the idea is that two becomes a trustworthy or reliable witness. So two times 12, obviously it's 12 plus 12. We can say uh, Old Testament, New Testament, something like that. And then we'll get 12 times 12 and 144,000 in chapter seven, but uh, very good. Okay, very good. Anything else? Any other comments or thoughts or observations? What else do you see? Four. Four what, uh, Rob? The, the creatures, four creatures. Okay. Four living four. creatures. Yep, very good. All right, we'll discuss them in a bit, but four then represents creation. So very good. Somebody else? There's a word think, that I, oh go ahead. Yeah, Rob. No, my thing is is the throne. Yeah, there you go. That's what I was the, actually leading to that. Yeah. I I don't I don't get the part where you know like fireworks are going off and ah, okay. Yeah, I, I don't get that part. Okay, we'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, the word throne occurs 12 times in this chapter, and it's probably a distinct section, so it's easy to, to see its beginning and its ending. And so the fact that it's 12 times within the section says, oh, okay, cool. So obviously it's the most, I think it's the most prominent word in this chapter. Uh, and it begins with, I saw a door standing open in heaven and I, I went up in heaven. I'm like, I saw a throne standing there. Oh, and one sitting on the throne. So clearly the focal point of the chapter is the one sitting on the throne. And then around the throne were elders and around the throne were this and around the throne were that. And then they, they fall down before the throne and they worship the one who sits on the throne. So the throne is clearly the most significant um, feature of this chapter. So we'll have to look at that. So, all right, anybody else? Okay. All right, let's point. Uh, I'm going to make more of this as we proceed. I don't want to like overwhelm you with like so much stuff that you like lose track of the key things. Clearly, we have what, uh, what I would prefer to call the second story. We discussed this in the last couple of weeks. The first story was John on Patmos. And he's on Patmos and he sees a vision of Jesus and he's told to write to the seven churches and he writes to the seven churches. When the seven churches, the letters to the seven churches or the messages to the seven churches are done, you're like, okay. We're, the story's over with. We had no clue in the first three and a half chapters that, or three chapters, that anything else was going to happen. And all of a sudden, he's done with the seven messages, and he's like, oh, guess what? I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which is the voice of the, the like of Jesus that was like a trumpet, said, hey, come up here. And I go, oh, a new scene takes place. A new scene. John was on Patmos in chapter one, uh, the first scene, and now he's taken to heaven. All right, and we won't don't worry about the details, but in both passages, he's in the spirit. All right, and so we, we see this is a clear indication of what we call um, textual or structural markers, where it's it's a new beginning. Now we've discussed the last couple of weeks that this new beginning, which is I'm calling it the second story, um, and the second narrative, whatever you might want to go, uh, is connected to the first. We've we've discussed that already, and we can continue as we proceed. So don't think of like, oh, that one was there and this one's here. They have nothing to do with each other. They're totally connected. In fact, the second, the first story, the seven messages ended with, oh, if you overcome, you can sit down with me on my throne. Just like I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That's chapter three, verse 21. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Like three verses later, I saw a throne. Oh, that's the one Jesus is sitting on. It's the father's throne. So there's a clear segue from the throne and 
chapter three, verse 21 to the segue of the throne uh, in chapter uh, in chapter four. So um, that's cer certainly what's going on. So we have a new story though. And this new story now is John's in heaven and he sees a vision. So he had a vision in chapter one, nine through three, 22. And now he has an another vision. Okay, any other thoughts or comments as we proceed? All right, so our major background, and it's not super important that you under, because this, this is going to like, if you thought chapter four is kind of wacky and like what's going on, what we're about to read is even worse. So, um, but the point of it is, and the reason why we're, we're going to read it, it's Ezekiel chapter one. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter one, the reason why we're about to read it is because you're going to see a lot of parallels. And it's very obvious that the imagery that John's using is from Ezekiel chapter one. So, all right, oops, I guess my Greek New Testament's not gonna have Ezekiel chapter one in it. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter one. And it's a long chapter, so maybe we'll break it up if someone wants to read, uh, let's see, um, it's 28 verses. So maybe we'll read seven verses at a time. One through seven, eight through 14, 20, uh, 15 through 21 and 22 through 28. So if four of you guys are willing to read, and since it's a smaller group tonight, some of you might need to read it a second time, that's fine. Um, just unmute your mic and begin reading. Ezekiel 1, 1 through 7. Let's start with. I'll read that. In the third, 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, is that the right place? While I was among the exiles by the river Chebar, the heavens opened and I saw divine visions. On the fifth day of the month, the fifth year, that is King Jehoiachin's exile, the word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar. There the hand of the Lord came upon me. As I looked, a storm wind came from the north, a huge cloud with flashing fire enveloped in brightness, from the midst of which the midst of the fire, something gleamed like e electrum. Within it were figures resembling four living creatures that looked like this. Their form was human, but each had four faces and four wings, and their legs went straight down. The soles of their feet were round. They sparkled with a gleam like burnished bronze. NIV, I'll read. Uh, under, their wing, under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings. And the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being. And on the right side, each had the face of a lion. And on the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side and each had two other wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, whatever turning as they went, without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures were like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creature faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. I can't remember how far I'm supposed to read. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside, okay. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Whenever the spirit Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, 
they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and offering. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out one toward the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with their wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a, th a throne of lapis lazuli, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was appearance, appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. Okay, so you can obviously see a number of things, right? That clearly parallel the two passages. And we're gonna spend some, we're gonna come back to Ezekiel several times and what you'll notice if we were to keep reading in the book of Ezekiel, chapters two and the beginning of chapter three, Ezekiel is going to become commissioned as a prophet. Did you notice, by the way, what did they just, what did he do? When Ezekiel was described at the beginning, Jackie read it, he was described as a what? What was his role? Let he was an exile. It. Yes, he was an exile. But I'm sorry, what was his title or his job description or his role? Priest. He was a priest. Yeah, so he's he's a priest, but now he's going to become a prophet. And so chapters two and three, he's going to be commissioned as a prophet. And so uh, same idea. John's going to be taken up into heaven, and then John's going to be commissioned to be a prophet. And that'll be in chapters 10 and 11 in the book of Revelation. Ezekiel's taken up into or taken up in a vision. He sees God, and then he's going to be commissioned to be a prophet. Another passage that we could read, which we won't do tonight, uh, is Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah is also taken into the throne room. And he sees uh, cherubim and seraph, or he sees seraphim, uh, and he's commissioned to be a prophet. Now go prophesy to these people. Who, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. He's being commissioned as a prophet. So these are prophetic commissioning passages that begin with a vision of, well, we kind of say the throne, but if we go back to Revelation chapter four for, for a moment now, you might notice that the one on the throne is not described. Right. In Ezekiel, he was described a little bit like, well, he's kind of looked like a man a little bit. Um, but for the most part, Revelation chapter four, God's not described. I mean, it's like the radiance and glory around him is what's described, but God actually is never described. Does that make sense? Uh, any any questions or comments or thoughts? You guys see some parallels there? What were some of the parallels that you might have noticed? Well, I, saw some like, I was going to say, I saw some parallels, but it's just I think it's just, I don't know, kind of blows my mind. It's been a whole chapter about wheels turning and wheels going this way and I, what does that have to do with the price of fish in china i'm mean, just <laughs> yeah. saying it's just like yeah i mean they go into this great detail yeah. about everything it's like i mean is that are we supposed to read into every little word and wheels that rise up and wheels that have the holy spirit and wheels that go this way and it's just like kind of mind-boggling yeah so um i think by the way the a much more the same kind of thinking chris would be in the book of Job. It's like, do we really need 40 something chapters of this, right? It's like, okay, what's, we don't even, what's even going on? But I get what you're saying. So let me uh, just, while we're still in Ezekiel 1, if you want to go back to Ezekiel 1 for a second, I'll speak to it just briefly. Uh, notice that Ezekiel begins uh, chapter one. Let me turn back on my Bible. I think he's by the, by the river Shabar. Um, Ezekiel is in exile. He's in Babylon. So he's one of the Jewish priests presumably from Jerusalem, but him and the rest of the Israelites are in Babylon. So if you know the story, uh, the Israelites were conquered by the Northern Kingdom of Assyria in 721 BC, and then they were conquered in 605 BC by the Babylonians, and the Southern Kingdom of Judah was taken to Babylon. 
Now in Babylon, they lived as a community. So their, their identity as Jewish people was preserved because they lived as a community of Jewish people and kind of like in a Jewish enclave. But notice where the vision happens. The vision doesn't happen in Jerusalem. It happens in Babylon. And the key then is God's in Babylon also. And you'll see that as we as you proceed through the book of Ezekiel. I think it's chapter 11 or 14. And Ezekiel says, God's in exile. The people of Israel were sent out and they were departed from the, the temple, which is where God dwells, but God left actually also. And that's actually really significant when you get to the, get to the New Testament. And then what he describes is God sitting on a throne. And we're going to go back to the throne in Revelation chapter 4 in just a moment. Uh, but that throne has wheels. I don't know if you knew this, by the way, but God's throne has wheels. And the reason why is because a chair, it's a chariot throne. And in the ancient world, the kings rode in the battle on a chariot. All right. Obviously, it's a victorious battle uh, on a chariot. And so God's being described as a king riding into a, a battle with a, a, a chariot uh, on a chariot throne. Uh, now, the beings around God manifest his glory and his magnificence and are beings that were responsible for the worship of God. But we'll go back to Revelation chapter four to kind of kind of spell them out there, but that's, it's the glory there. So if you're in Ezekiel, the first thing you're going to go is, oh, this is good news because we thought our God was conquered. We thought our God was inferior to the gods of Babylon. That's why Babylon conquered us. And now we realize our God's with us. We're in exile and God's with us in exile. And so it's this good, it's kind of this good news. Hey, here's why you're in exile because of these things. But here's the fact that God's with you in exile and then God will bring you back and bring you to the restoration. So when you get to the end of the book of Revelation, Ezekiel is going to be really important again. Because the idea of the new creation and the new Jerusalem, it's all coming from the book of Ezekiel. So um, we will the, hard, the hard part there is just, I think of God as being above, so far above everything. And it's hard to imagine thinking back then that there was another God that's even close to being like, this is God who created the universe and the stars and everything. And you know what I'm saying? It's just like, he's so beyond and great, wonderful. It's like, how can you even think he's at the same level of some of these man-made gods? I guess that's a hard thing just because we're not back in those times. Uh, that's part of it. But part of it also is the fact that God condescends into, into his creation, right? The most uh, obvious example of that is the incarnation. Jesus became human. So God comes down to us. The next obvious indication of that is we have books called Genesis through Revelation. That's God coming down saying, you know what? Speak to these people and tell them what I think. So even though God transcends, he also manifests himself. And obviously today we have the spirit of God dwelling in our hearts. And he, and he does works of miracles and manifests gifts of the spirit. These are all God manifesting himself within his creation. So even though he is transcendent, and I think that's why Revelation 4 doesn't describe him, by the way, is because you can't describe him. He's, he's indescribable. Um, but uh, I, I think that's what's going on there. So, all right. Anybody else as we move back to Revelation 4 first now, or unless you have any thoughts of, of Ezekiel? Go ahead, Jackie. I have a question that is not about the content, but my numbering in Ezekiel is not consecutive. And is that the case in any other Bibles or is it my particular Bible? Um, what do you mean by not consecutive? I'm not sure. What well, are you referring to? It goes to verse 7. And then from seven, it goes to 10, uh, 12, and then it goes to verse eight. So, do you have a Catholic Bible? Yes. That's why. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And so, and I figured you, you might have. Yeah. And so what you're dealing with, uh, how about, how about if I answer that after we're done? That, that's fine. Stay on that's for a five minutes instead of interrupting this. Yeah. That's it's not fine. interrupting, but that's, yeah, that, that's an interesting observation. I didn't even realize that. So, okay. yeah. So uh, very good. Okay, let's go to Revelation chapter four then and kind of work our way through the text and kind of work our way down the notes. And I try to give you substantive notes this week. I don't always do that to kind of help guide you through the passage. Um, let's see, at the beginning of your notes, I have a little bit of a script. And uh, the, the third paragraph down, it says the heavenly worship scene. This is clearly a worship scene. Uh, chapter four, one through five, 14 is critical to understanding the message of the book of Revelation. Primarily, it establishes this, that God is sovereign. That is, he's the one who's on the throne, not Caesar. And that's what Ezekiel was doing too. God's on the throne, not Baal or Marduk and the gods of the Babylonians. 
Like it or not, the book of Revelation is very political. Then again, so are the gospels. Jesus is the king of kings or the, true, uh, or the world's true king. So the first thing that we open up in Revelation 4, we realize God's on the throne. And that is an emphatic statement, meaning Caesar's not. Or Caesar's throne's not the legitimate throne. God's throne is. So really, really, really significant. Um, moving on. There are two key questions. Right, now, this is something that you're not going to find in a lot of commentaries in the book of Revelation. I think they would not disagree with me, but uh, it's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the fact when I get my commentary published, which might not be till like 2024 when it, when it finally comes out, uh, and to see what the scholarly world does with it. You know, what's their, how, what, how do they respond to my, my thesis? My thesis is that Revelation is telling you a story. You had two stories, really. You have the first one in chapters one through three, the second one in chapters four through 16. Right? And don't worry, about the, don't worry about the chapter numbers. The second story now begins with God sitting on a throne. And now there's a third and fourth story also. So the, the, the second story you can kind of say goes through chapter 22 if you want, but that's okay. And I think there's two key themes in this story. And that is, number one is what's needed so that the throne of God, which is in heaven in chapter four, can come down to the earth or the new creation because it does that in chapter 21. So in chapter 21, the throne of God comes down to the earth. The earth and heaven become one. So I think Revelation is saying, hey, look, what happened? What happened in the middle to the God's throne? And let me say it again. So that where God dwells comes down to us. It's merged with us. What happens or what's needed to happen so that these two things can happen? This is the key question in the book of Revelation. The second question, which is actually related to the first question, is how are the nations redeemed? Now, <coughs> excuse me. We haven't discussed the nations yet. We'll get to them a little bit in chapter five, but they really become more important in chapter six, seven, and, and later on. What we notice, or what we will notice, we don't notice this yet, is that the nations are kind of opposed to God's work. So in chapter 13, the nations are aligned with the beast, and the nations are under the influence of the dragon, and the nations are allied with the, the harlot or the prostitute. The nations kill the two witnesses in chapter 11, and they actually send gifts to one another when the two witnesses are dead. Like, yes, cool. We, these two people tormented us for all these years, and now they're finally dead. Or, they're not two people, but whatever. Um, they tormented us, and they, they rejoice. So the nations are stand up. The nations have the mark of the beast. The people of God have, six, have the name of God on their foreheads. The nations have 666 on the foreheads. So throughout the book of Revelation, the nations seem to be opposed, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in chapter five. They seem to be opposed to God and his work. Yet in chapter 21 and 22, they walk in the new Jerusalem. It says the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. You're like, oh, what, ha what happened? I mean, that's a surprise. I wasn't expecting that. Now, obviously, if we read the Gospels, we are expecting that. If we read the book of Acts, we are expecting that. But that makes sense? Two key questions. How does the new Jerusalem, how does what's in heaven, God's throne, come to the, down to the earth? What has to happen for that to, to occur? It's another way of saying, why hasn't Jesus come back yet, right? Because when Jesus comes back, heaven and earth become one again. The new creation happens, and depending on your view of the millennium, which we'll discuss some other time. Um, secondly, how do the nations go from persecuting God's people and rejoicing when they're killed, having the mark of the beast in their forehead to walking in the light of the new, of the new Jerusalem? And when I say that, by the way, I'm not saying that all the nations do, because some of the nations get thrown in the lake of fire or, or some of the people within the nations do. Okay. That's, that's fine. I don't think everyone actually gets saved. It'd be nice if everyone did, but I don't think that's true. So those are the two questions that we want to be observing as we move forward. So it begins with this throne. So quick anecdote. When I first started teaching like 30 years ago, and I was just this raw kid that didn't know anything and was doing the best I could and trying to teach Bible and things like that. And I'll go, hey, you know, I, um, Revelation 4 and 5, you know, the 1, 2, and 3. Okay, cool. You got these seven messages and let's talk about the seven messages. And then four and five, like nothing really happens. It's just about like God sitting in heaven. And then chapter six, the first, the seven seals are broken and then everything starts to happen, right? He breaks the first seal and then, ah, oh, there's all this calamity on there. Let's just skip to chapter six. 
And now I look back and go, oh, that was really stupid because four and five is is really the whole the whole focus of the book. And so the first point though is God's on the throne, therefore Caesar's not. Now let's go back to kind of what we discussed in the seven letters a little or seven messages. And that's this, or, or even to reality today. If you look at the world today, it doesn't look like God's on the throne. It looks like Putin's on the throne or um, uh, uh, commercialism and goods and corporate America or corporations are on the throne. It looks like a lot of other things are on the throne besides God. Uh, you've got famines in Somalia. You've got a war and devastation in Ukraine and other parts of the world and Ethiopia. You have crisis. All it doesn't look like God's in control. And if he's on the throne, then why is all this happening? That's one of the questions that we want to address, which we will in chapter six and, and following. So, but the point of that is, is that is, now the, John's readers are going, not only does it not look like God's on the throne, but we're proclaiming God and they're throwing us in prison and they're killing us and they're, it, it doesn't look like God's on the throne. What, what's going on here? So again, the message of hope. Hey guys, it might not look this way, but the reality is God's on the throne. And that's why we started, I think our first one of our first weeks with the passage in 1 Kings 6. Hey God, show my servant what's really going on. I'm surrounded by an army, but the armies of God are surrounding that army. So that's kind of uh, what's happening there. Does that make sense? God is the one on the throne. Very good. Any questions or comments as we move forward? All right, so let's go through the notes here. Uh, letter A, there's a door in, uh, under chapter four, verses one, two, and two A means the beginning of verse two. Uh, and two B means the middle or end of verse two. There's a door in heaven, come up here. He's in the spirit and I will show you. that. Those three phrases are gonna be very important for later on, but don't, don't worry about that. Uh, four, two B through verse three is a description of God sitting on a throne and he's sitting uh, on the throne. Now, guess how many times, this might be hard, Let's see how good you are, the phrase, the one who sits on the throne occurs in the book of Revelation. Come on. Seven. seven. Oh, that was so hard. I can't believe you got it right. Yeah, yeah, seven. The one who sits on the throne, seven times. Because God is in complete control. He's total. He's, he's pow all powerful. He's sovereign. He's holy. The one who sits on the throne seven times. All right. So um, let's see. Verse, chapter four, verse two. Uh, one sitting, uh, um, uh, a throne was standing in heaven, one sitting on it. He was sitting with like, and depending on your translation, there's two stones here. Both of these stones, a Jasper stone and a Sardius stone. First off, I don't know if you know this, but in the Old Testament, the, the high priest had a vest. And that vest had 12 jewels on it. I don't know if, you, if you're aware of that. And the 12 jewels represent the 12 tribes. The first stone on, the, on, the, on his vest was Jasper and the last stone was Sardius. That's the first and last stone on the high priest's vest. Okay, so I, I didn't put that on your notes, but that's, oh, okay. And again, the, 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 the vest represents the 12 tribes because the high priest was the representative of Israel, of the, of the people of Israel. So 12, obviously, and the, the fact that tw the throne appears 12 times in this chapter is something significant. Um, now together, uh, they, are, they're kind of, they're, they basically are a reddish in color. Uh, and that's, that's like a fiery appearance that corresponds to God's description in the book of Ezekiel, I, I noticed. Uh, I, I noted. Now, remember our description of Jesus in chapter 1. Uh, Revelation 1, 12 through 16, you know, he has his head and hair are white like wool, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze. As we went through those descriptions in chapter one, we said each one of these descriptions seemed to primarily focus on Jesus as the judge. And guess what? A fiery appearance to God's description sitting on a throne. It's a courtroom throne. God's being described as the ultimate judge. But the question's going to be, well, when are you going to judge? And that'll come up in chapter six. If you're in, in power, that's good to know because... And Ezekiel, like we're in Babylon and this ain't good. Or if you're in the seven mess, seven churches of Revelation, like this isn't good because we're being threatened by the Roman uh, um, entourage and Roman Roman religion and imperial religion. And the Jews are setting us out from the, from the synagogues. And this is not going well for us. We're economically starving to death. Oh, you're on the throne. Cool. Great. Would you bring your throne down here pretty, pretty soon? I mean, 
So it, it's good news. It's, it's a message of hope. But it's like, yeah, how long is this going to be, Lord? Ah, something has to happen before the throne comes down. And we have to go over that um, as we proceed. All right, but uh, the idea of God uh, as uh, uh, all-powerful sovereign sitting on his throne. All right, very well. All right, that's, I think that's enough of that. Uh, chapter four, verses four through seven, we have 24 elders and four living creatures. Now, the four living creatures were clearly described in the book of Ezekiel. And there's differences between the two, but that's okay. But let's go to the 24 elders first. They have white garments, which I didn't discuss here in our notes, but just remind yourself of white garments. Okay, well, and we'll, I'll, rem I'll remind you later. Don't worry about it. Uh, but nonetheless, and they have golden crowns. If they have crowns, and by the way, they're sitting on thrones, then anybody have an idea who these are? If you were in our Genesis study, you might, you might, there's your clue. Who, what is the fact that they're sitting on thrones and they have golden crowns seem to indicate? Just think of crowns and throne. The tribes. Uh, okay. But think of specifically, because we'll have to look at the number 24, Chris. Think of specifically a crowns and a throne that symbolizes that they are ruling. Ruling. Yeah, they're they're ruling. So uh back in the uh, old testament, this is the divine council. Right? Remember, Satan was like a fallen member. God decides, and then we discuss this in our Genesis study, that he is sovereign and in charge, but he's you know what? I'm gonna make man, let them rule. Humanity is gonna rule for him. God could rule all by himself, but you know what? I'm going to create humanity and they're going to rule. And when they rule, they're going to make me known. They're going to bear my image. But then we also found out that there were angelic beings that were also apparently part of this divine council. And again, we're not going to go off on a tangent on that, uh, but it's on the Genesis study. And if you're listening on Facebook Live, it's on, on the podcast episode. It's probably maybe in the month of August of this year. Uh, determinedtruth.com, go to the podcast. Uh, and those of you that are new to the, our study, you can get the recordings on the podcast there uh, from our Genesis study. Okay, so the 24 elders appear to be, well, angelic representatives. This is number three in the notes under, um, well, it says B, it should be A. Uh, angelic representatives of the people of God. They're angelic representatives of the people of God. They're angelic beings certainly. And the fact that there's 12 and 12 or 24 of them probably suggests that they the, represent the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. It could be the 12 patriarchs, but it's more likely the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Now, bear in mind, 12 and 12, Old and New Testament together. So don't think Old Testament like they're over there, New Testament, we're over here, you know, never shall the twain meet. No, they totally meet. All right. So 12 and 12, I, I think that's what's going on there. And I think they're angelic representatives of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. And some people are like, well, it can't be true because if John's one of the 12 apostles, he's seeing himself. It's like, he's not seeing himself. He's seeing an angelic representative of the 12 leaders of God's people. Um, so, uh, okay. So that's, that's the 24 elders. And there's like 40 different views out there. But I think that's the more prominent view in the, in the book in Revelation scholarship. Um, but there's like 40 different views because there's everyone has to have an opinion on things like that when, they're, when it's not clear. All right, flash of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder come from the throne. Those are signs of coming judgment. But we're also going to make note of that phrase later on also. So uh, again, and I can't, I could overwhelm you with this and, and get you lost. But every single word in the book of Revelation was carefully chosen. And so when you look up, when you see Jasper, for example, one of the stones, the first thing to recognize is, well, it, it probably has an Old Testament context because the four, you know, the four living beings, clear, four living creatures clearly come from the book of Ezekiel. So the imagery comes from the Old Testament, but then it takes on a New Testament meaning. And that New Testament meaning is through, through the lens of Jesus. So instead of there being 12 elders, there's 24 because it's Old and New Testament kind of combined. Um, flash of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder uh, signify judgment. But what, what um, finish that last thought. What you want to do then, and it's hard for you to do, is watch how this word appears later on in the book. So, for example, Jasper only occurs, and like it's the first stone listed in the description of God. The next time it occurs is in Revelation 21. It's the first stone 
that's describing what the new Jerusalem is made of. You're like, oh, but the new Jerusalem is the church because I'm going to show you the bride. And I looked and I saw oh, the holy city. The holy city isn't a city. Well, it kind of is, but it, it's it's a description of the church. Or I hate saying church in Israel. I hate that, that those phrases. It's a description of God's people in the new creation where there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The, all of God's people, all the New Testament saints, all God's people in history are dwelling in God's presence. And the very first thing that's described with them is Jasper stone. You're like, but Jasper was used to describe God. Ah, so that'll be important. So also then the phrase flash lightning sounds and peals of thunder. We're going to watch that phrase and I'll, I'll point it out later on as it, as it continues to occur. So, okay. All right. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the, and now it tells us that the seven spirits of God. And we notice them in chapter one. I, I didn't put it down, by the way. In chapter one, um, uh, John uh, to the seven churches from the one who sits in the throne, uh, uh, the one who is, who was, and who is to come from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ. It has to be Father, Spirit, and Jesus in Revelation chapter one. I hope I didn't go over that too quickly, but that was kind of review. Now it says the seven spirits of God. Right? The primary path, and we're not gonna bother looking at this, but the primary passage for that is Isaiah 11. And if you look up Isaiah 11, verse two, you're gonna see the word spirit seven times. It says the spirit of wisdom, spirit of justice, the spirit, and, and set, there's seven of them. Um, and so that's probably what it is. It's reference to the, some translations will say the sevenfold spirit. And it, it's the Holy Spirit, I, I think it is. It's, uh, there were seven lamps before, burning before the throne. Um, later on in the book, I didn't put this on your notes, but Jesus is the, uh, there, there's no, uh, sun in the New Jerusalem, because the Lord all God, Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb are its lamp. So God's the lamp. So the lamp now is the Holy Spirit. There we go. So uh, there are right, as a sea of glass, right? And um, the sea will be another important word. And uh, some of these I'm kind of glossing over because I don't want you to get like so overwhelmed with all the details. But the word sea is really important in the scriptures. And we did a podcast on the gospel of Mark. And I think our fourth podcast would be like the last week of January of 2022. Our podcast, we interviewed a biblical scholar to talk about the imagery in the gospel of Mark and its Old Testament origins. Because Jesus like does a lot of things on the sea. He calms the sea, but he doesn't calm it. He rebukes it. In fact, the same word for rebuke that that's used in Mark chapter four is the same word that's used for when he rebukes the spirits in Mark chapter one. They're like, oh. The spirits are associated with demonic beings. So when Jesus walks on the water, when he casts the demons out of the pigs and they run into the sea, the sea is, if you remember in our Genesis study, the sea is chaos. The sea represented chaos. There, 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 these waters covered the earth and God couldn't, he, 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 not that he couldn't, but he didn't create until he separates the waters and creates dry ground. The sea is chaos. It's also in the book of Job and elsewhere where, where Leviathan and behemoth roam and uh, the Leviathan roams. It's the, the dragon, the sea creature that is like the epitome of evil dwells in the sea. In Revelation 13, we're going to have a beast coming up out of the sea. Ah, oh. so the sea is associated with um, hell. If you want to write that down, if you want, if you're taking notes, whatever. It's associated with the hell or in the book of Revelation, the abyss. It's the place of chaos and destruction. And what happens is now, this sea is like a sea of glass. It's calm. God's calmed the storms. And so God is controlling the sea, the, the chaos. And so it, it signifies that. And of course, more specifically, it might represent this bronze labor, this, which was called the sea um, that's set into outside the temple itself uh, there. So that's kind of the idea behind that. Okay. Then there are four living creatures. Okay, and they're clearly related to the cherubim in, in the book of Ezekiel. There's, there, are diff, there are differences. They're also compared to the seraphim in the, in the book of Isaiah. And by the way, the seraphim in Isaiah, they're serpents. So just, just, I'm just saying, they're actually serpents. But they seem to represent. Now, in, the, in, in Ezekiel, all the cherubim, all four, I'm sorry, all four of the living creatures have all the attributes. In the book of Revelation, the four living creatures, like one was like a lion, one had one was like a calf or an ox. 
And one ha- one was like a had a face like that of a man, and the fourth was like a flying uh, eagle. And they seem to represent, and there's like 25 different views on this also, that the lion is the most powerful of all the undomesticated animals. The lion is the king of the jungle, right? And it's the most powerful domest- undomesticated animal. The calf, especially to an agrarian culture, to, right, to a culture that plants crops, it's the most powerful domesticated animal. And it could be a, an ox would, would be a sufficient translation for it. Uh, and then humanity obviously represents hu- human beings. And then the eagle was the fastest of all the flying birds. And so the eagle is a representative of the birds, which means you have all the created animals or created beings, not including the angelic beings, the, of all the created beings on earth, you have domesticated, undomesticated, human, and birds. Now you don't have fish. That's because they're in the sea. And the sea is chaos, right? It's kind of like, is there any, are there any fish in the New Jerusalem? No, because there's no sea, right? And there's a question, are there lions in the, in the New Jerusalem? Probably, because the New Jerusalem is the restoration of creation. And that creation has all of the created animals within it, except the fish. We can go either way. It doesn't matter. I don't think we're going to stake our our, our, our ground on, like, they're, they're definitely our dogs. My, my dog is there. Great. Not, no problem at all. And if a child has a dog that dies, you know what? It's going to be in heaven someday. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I think I think they're, they're there. In fact, I think the difference is, what I would say about the, the 24 elders and the four living creatures is this. The 24 elders are the representative of the people of God the angelic representatives of the people of God. The four living creatures are the angelic representatives of all created beings, right? On the earth, all created beings. Does that make sense? Now, and I put down a little note, by the way, note the references here, you can look them up later. The elders and the living creatures are almost always together, right? They they almost always, there's one exception in chapter 11, verse 16, but uh, otherwise they're always together. So that's very interesting that these two uh, groups of angelic beings seem to be always together. Very, all right, now, any questions here? They're like, well, well, why is he telling us all this, right? Uh, why is he telling us all this? Well, the answer actually is found in verses eight to 11. And the answer is this, that God is worthy of being glorified or being worshiped because he's holy and sovereign and the creator. So these are beings that are before the throne of God. They are. Um, ruling alongside God in the heavenly realms. But now we're told they're actually responsible for the worship of God. The four living creatures, in fact, never stop saying, holy, 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 which, by the way, is an exaggeration to make a point because in the next chapter, they're going to say something else. So they don't always say, holy, holy, holy. But the point of that is, this is worship scene, holy, holy, holy. Now note, by the way, three times. Three is the number for the divine. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, who um, uh, God Almighty. And then it says, uh, they fall down before, uh, they worship the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Right now, we're going to follow that phrase also, because guess how many times that phrase occurs? It's not seven, it's three. Just, in, just that way you didn't say it incorrectly. It's three times. The one who is, who was, and who is to come. Now, what do you think that phrase uh, expresses? Who, one who is, who was, and who is to come. What, the, what does that say about God? It's not bound by time. Uh, oh, yeah, very good. Yeah, he's eternal. Yeah, he's, he's eternal. Yeah, yeah, he, he's always present. He, it's the same thing as, by the way, it's a, it means the same thing as I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Except it specifically states he is to come. So it points towards God's eternality, who was, who is, and who is to come, but it also points towards, and he's coming. So again, the kingdom of God's here, but it's also not yet here. It's here because God reigns, and that's reigning through Jesus' death and resurrection. It's here because the spirit dwells in our hearts. Remember, the key feature of God's kingdom is God dwells with us. So when the new Jerusalem comes down, It means God's dwelling is with humanity. And it says that in chapter 21, verses 3 and 7. 
However, he's not here in fullness because when he's here in fullness, there'd be no more death or crying or pain or sin or worries. And so that's, it, he's here and he's not yet here. And that's what who is, who was, and who is, and is to come uh, specifies. So keep watching for this phrase because it's going to change suddenly and uh, later on. All right. Now also note that the four living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks. Again, note three words. And we're totally supposed to count the number of words. There's no question about that. Three words, because it's referencing the divine. But pay attention to these words. And this is where, again, having a good translation that translates these words consistently all the time is really going to be helpful. Um, but we'll, we'll move on. When we get to next week, chapter five, we're going to see these words again, and it'll be very, it'll be really important. And I'll, I'll point it out, so don't worry about it. All right, the 24 elders, however, uh, let's see, here we go, verse uh, 10. It says, uh, the 24 elders fell down before the one sitting on the throne, and they worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. Uh, and they cast or they throw their, th their crowns before the throne, saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory honor um, and, uh, and power because, depending on your translation, or for, because you created all things and by your will they were and they came into existence, right? So our Lord and our God, ah, he's sovereign, right? Not Caesar is. Remember, the key statement in Judaism is, or the key verse in Judaism is Deuteronomy 6, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, is one. Ah, this is our Lord and our God. He's totally sovereign. Caesar is not. And guess what? He created all things. Okay. By your will, they existed and they came into being or they were created, however you want to translate that. Okay. Any questions or comments or thoughts here as we go? Um, can you read the uh, that the, the seven spirit shares to? Uh, I'm sorry, Marcus, what was the question about the seven spirits? Yeah, uh, what you have said, could you please repeat that, repeat that word again? Uh, yes, okay, the sure. Um, the, the reference, the Old Testament reference for the seven spirits is probably Isaiah chapter 11. It's also Zechariah 4, which is a really important passage that we'll get to later. In Isaiah chapter 11, it says he's the spirit of wisdom. Uh, let me, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, Isaiah 11, verse 2, it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. That's one, spirit of the Lord. The spirit of wisdom, too. The spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge, and, the, and most likely the spirit of the fear of the Lord. There's the sevenfold spirit as it's, taken to, as it's understood in Judaism. And John's probably adopting that here in Revelation chapter 11. Now, it's probably a reference to the one spirit. It's not seven spirits. It's the one spirit, as Christians, we would say. It's the one spirit who embodies these seven features. All right. Could you call them attributes? Um, yeah, that's fine. Characteristics, attributes, sure. Yeah, uh, uh, who, who he is. Now, notice um, if you want to skip over Revelation chapter 5 for a second. Revelation chapter 5, uh, we'll see that Jesus um, have Revelation 5 verse 6. I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent on all, into all the earth. So the seven eyes, well, seven's perfection or totality. It means they see everything. And the seven eyes are associated with the Holy Spirit, which means he sees all things because it says, which are the seven spirits of God. And then they're sent out into all the earth. So again, our scene here in Revelation 4, I hope that makes sense, Marcus. Let me see if I can summarize it this way. Our scene in Revelation 4 is God sitting on the throne and he's the judge. And he's holy and he's sovereign and he's worthy of worship because he created all things and because he's holy. And around that throne are these created beings that are or angelic beings that are responsible for the worship of God. And they give him the worship that he's, that he's worthy of. And if you're reading this to John's readers, it's like, this is good news. This is hope. That means that Caesar's not in power, even though it looks like he is. God's in power. And this God who's in power is the one who is to come. And he's a just judge, and he will bring judgment, 
but we're going to find out in chapter six, they're going to go, well, how long, oh Lord? Like, when are you going to do this? Like, we're ready now. You know, anytime now, well, I know it's like whenever you want, but uh, we're all good now. All in favor? I, I, thank you. We all say, I. Um, and that's kind of what's, what's going on. So it's encouragement to the church under persecution, under the threat of persecution, and who are suffering for persevering, and it gives them hope. And it reminds them that God's in, God's in power. Does that make sense to Marcus? Is, uh, any other questions? That's, that's, that's his question. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right. I'd like you to say um, the seven spirits a little more slowly. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So the seven spirits of God refer to the Holy Spirit as the all-powerful, mighty spirit of God that's sent into creation. So it's the, it's the wholeness or completion of totality of God that goes out into creation. And of course, that's the spirit of, of that's the Holy Spirit that goes out in creation through the church, right through Jesus and then through the church to proclaim, uh, to manifest God's holiness and God's glory. I hope, does that help, Jackie? Anything, anything else that I left off or? Well, you named some of Oh, so it's, it's Isaiah 11.2. Just look up Isaiah 11.2, Jackie. Okay. Yep. Yep. Just, just, just look up uh, Isaiah 11.2. And the word spirit doesn't occur seven times, but six times, but you can, you'll see how it works. And that's, okay. this is Judaism that affirms it. That's the sevenfold spirit from, from there. Okay. And uh, uh, Zechariah 4 is really important. We won't go over it tonight, um, but note, obviously the spirit of God is um, very significant in uh, the empowering of God's people. Okay. Any questions, comments? We finished like four minutes early. That's like got to be a record tonight, huh? Very good. Okay. Anything else? No? Okay. So this worship scene is going to be very important for next week. And that we might actually, I'm hoping we can finish all of chapter five in one week, but there's so many significant questions in chapter five. All this is laying the foundation. We cannot go forward without understanding this foundation of Revelation four and Revelation five. Okay. And uh, Revelation five, they're going to start turning and worshiping Jesus. So that, that says everything there. Okay. Any questions, comments, sign remarks? So would, would it be fair, Rob? <clears throat> When you go back and you read about uh, holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty, who he was and is to come, uh, this act of worship is, is is this something that we actually should be grabbing hold of? Because I think that that one of the thing more of this this idea that what heaven will be, and it's more it looks more like what we think it is on earth, just translated to heaven. And it looks like to me that what heaven is, is the ability to worship Jesus right there all the time. And we will be doing this all the time for eternity. And not to be afraid of this, not to say, oh, gosh, how could I say these three phrases my whole eternal life, yeah. but embrace this to the point of just desiring this now yeah is that fair to say or am i wrong um i would uh i would say it differently and from number one these are angelic beings this is these are not human beings so i wouldn't translate well, and go, okay these angelic that. beings i they, understand that okay so i wouldn't say it because these angelic beings are always worshiping god therefore we're always worshiping god right and um i don't think that's what's out i don't think that's necessarily correct um Secondly, when you get to Revelation 21 and 22, which is, that's the climax, that's the new Jerusalem, that's, that's heaven coming down, that, that's the new creation. It's not described as this eternal worship scene. It's not. It's described as this eternal flourishing of nations and peoples and justice and equity. So I don't know that anyone would be so bold as to say, I think this is what's going on in the new Jerusalem with any level of authority. So let me speculate, but I'm, but with no level of authority saying this is definitely I'm, I'm really confident that this is what's going to be like but if i were to, were to speculate i think it would be humanity 
dwelling in God's divine eternal presence that uh, emanates throughout the entirety of creation and th throughout the entirety of, of the world, because the New Jerusalem en encompasses the entire uh, earth or the, the new created earth. And um, tilling the soil and eating foods and, and uh, enjoying company and fellowshipping and working and, and, and being humans without pain or suffering or mourning or death, without injustice, without inequity, without evil rulers taking over power. And um, instead, with God being sovereign and us flourishing, I think that's certainly worship is absolutely a part of it, but I don't think it's an eternal worship scene. You know, so casting crowns, that, that Christian band, that's where they get their name from because the right. 24 elders are casting their crowns. Well, that are angelic beings casting their crowns. I don't know that human beings are, or, you know, Paul says you have the crown of life or the crown of righteousness. You know, we have all these crowns waiting for us. I don't know that they're literal or not, but nonetheless, I don't know that we just sit there and throw them before the throne. Because guess what? Once you throw it, let me go get it back so I can throw it again. I, you know, I don't think that's what's happening, but I don't think we know. Well, I, so I guess uh, my point is that I, I always think and, and I wonder what it's going to be like to look at Jesus and look in Jesus' eyes and the, just being overwhelmed, yeah. stirring him for 40 years. And I can't imagine thinking about anything else but that. And so yeah. when I see that, I'm thinking, gosh, I maybe I need to do more of that here. Yeah. Yes. Because that's my desire is him. And those other things don't seem to be as much. And maybe that's wrong. I think what you're saying is truthful. And and uh, yeah. but I'm just looking at this and that's what stood out to me. So okay. I would say yes, you're right. Okay, but let's so number one. Um, in Revelation 22, it says they will see his face and his name will be on their forehead. We don't, no one has ever seen God, right? Moses did not see his face. Moses, Moses saw the back of God, right? So what a powerful statement in Revelation. I think it's 22 verse three. Um, we will see his face and, and his name will be on their forehead. Uh, number one. Number two, yeah, we definitely are supposed to be doing this more often now, but I don't think that means sitting in a church singing holy 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 because jesus himself said whenever you gave a drink of water to one of these, at least these brothers of mine you did it to me absolutely yes I, I think i think it has this practical application of saying of seeing god's presence within the created realm and manifesting they'll know you're my disciples if you love one another so i think it has this practical application too and maybe i'm being too too focused on okay. that thing because you're right. When you do something unto others, uh, you see Jesus. So yeah, that and that's worship. That is absolutely worship. So yeah, yeah that's that's absolutely worship. In fact, Jesus Himself says. So I'm sorry, Bill. Go ahead. I'm just sorry. I, that, it just really jumped out at me okay. that those three phrases and mm. uh, just how how I long to be with Him. So yeah, yeah, and uh, and Jesus Himself said that if you come to the altar to present your offerings. And remember that your brother has something against you. Uh, I don't want you here. Go be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So worship is manifested in Christ-like cross-bearing love for the sake of the other. Yeah, uh, that's worship. And then we come to God. Now, I think obviously communal worship is important because we're giving God thanks and praise and we're submitting to him and is manifesting himself and we're teaching and we're fellowshipping and we're encouraging all these things that happen when we gather together on a weekend service or whatever, whenever your service might be. But it's manifested in, in uh, uh, deeds for, well, the least of these brothers of mine. So, all right, very good. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the uh, recording and I'm going to stop the Facebook Live and we'll take some prayer requests. And oh, one more thing if you're on Facebook Live again and you want to be part of the Zoom Bible study, then go ahead and make sure you send me a message on Facebook Messenger uh, or an email, but let me know your email address so that I can include you in the Zoom link, and then you can have access to the notes, and uh, you can have access to the audio recordings also. Obviously, you have them on Facebook Live, but that's, no, that's beside the point. Very good.